while the youth are going off to their various classrooms, let's the rest of us open up our Bibles to the Gospel of Mark chapter 10, picking up where we left off last week here in verse 28. Be reading verses 28 through 45, and then we will look at it in detail. So Gospel of Mark chapter 10, beginning at verse 28. Like I said, 32. Mark chapter 10, verse 32. Verse 32. (laughs) Now they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was going before them, and they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. Then he took the twelve aside again and began to tell them the things that would happen to him. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes. And they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles, and they will mock him, scourge him, spit on him, and kill him. And on the third day he will rise again. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him, saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. (laughs) He said to them, Well, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Well, grant us that we may sit, one on your right hand and the other on your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? And they said to him, Oh, we are able. Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink the cup that I drink. And with the baptism I am baptized with, you will be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give but it is for those for whom it is prepared. Now when the ten heard it, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them to himself and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant." And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. So this morning, the message is entitled, They Still Don't Get It. And by the way, you're there in Mark chapter 10. Also go uh, one book to the left of your Bible to Matthew chapter 6, because we're going to flip over to there in a little while. So you want to have both places But there's Mark chapter 10 and then Matthew chapter 6. Uh, We're going to be eventually reading verses 19 through 21. Now, at this point, up to this point, Jesus had been trying, it seems in vain, but he'd been trying to teach his disciples about what greatness in God's eyes is all about. And it's self-sacrificial service. Self-sacrificial. Sacrificial service. What's great in God's eyes is when a person sacrifices of himself or herself in order to serve others. Now, Jesus didn't merely just talk the talk. Jesus walked the walk. In fact, he performed the greatest demonstration of self-sacrificial service ever. For Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins in full. Now, at this point in Mark's gospel, Jesus was on his way toward Jerusalem, knowing that this would be the final Passover when he would fulfill his great mission, where he would offer himself as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. As we read last week, as Jesus and his disciples were on the way, he was met by a rich young ruler. He approached Jesus, and if you look back at verse 17 of Mark 10, uh, he said to him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Basically asking the question, what works must I do? What things must I do? What religious observances must I observe in order for me to buy a place into heaven? To somehow secure a position in heaven, just like that old early 70s saw, I think it was early 70s, and she's buying a stairway to heaven. You know, some people think that they can buy, purchase away into eternal life, either through good works or even through money. Well, Jesus, as he spoke to the man, revealed to the young man that he had a problem. And the problem was a God 
problem. You see, the rich young ruler was in love with a false god, the one that the Greeks called Mammon, the god of money. And since the Lord will never share the throne of a person's life with any other, Jesus then told the rich young ruler in verse 21, he said to him, well, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have, give to the poor, you will have treasure in heaven. Now, it seems at that point that Jesus is saying you can purchase your way into heaven, but not so. Look at the next part. He said, but come, take up the cross. That means die to yourself, your, your own ways and all. Take up the cross and follow me. See, what saves us is that we follow Jesus. What saves us is that we trust him as our Savior and Lord. As we read in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead, then we're saved. And yet this young man, he thought he was worshiping the true and living God, but really deep down inside he was worshiping the false God of money. And so Jesus said, you've got to let that God go. In order to embrace the true and living God, you've got to let that false God go. Well, the man at verse 22, he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful. He had great possessions. Jesus looked around, said to his disciples, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. Well, the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answered again and said to them, children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astonished, saying among themselves, hey, well, then who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with men it is impossible. So man cannot save himself. But not with God, for with God all things are possible. In other words, only God can save a soul from eternal destruction. The rich young ruler was a good person, like you and I would think a good young person should be. But he wasn't good enough for God. This rich young ruler chose worldly success over heavenly reward, and therefore that's why he was spiritually bankrupt. Now at this point, the disciples got to thinking. It's always dangerous when we think, right? I've been thinking. Oh, wait, hold on there. (laughs) They got to thinking, if greatness in God's eyes is all about self-sacrifice, if that's true, you know, as Jesus said to the rich young ruler, if that's true, then what about us? Because we've sacrificed. We're following you, Jesus. What will we get? And so in verse 28, Jesus began to say to him, See, we have left all and followed you. So he asked him that. Or Matthew also records Peter also saying, Therefore, what shall we have? We've left all. We're following you. Or we might say, What's in it for us? How's this going to work out for us? In verse 29 of Mark 10, Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake in the Gospels. So there's no one who sacrificed of those earthly wonderful things, not just bad things, but good things, family relations, positions, possessions. There was one missionary back in the 1950s, a man named Jim Elliott, who was very well-to-do. He was very involved in his church and came from a great family and, and had a ministry in the church, decided to leave it all in order to travel to South America to minister to the unreached Aachen Indian tribe that was down there. And people asked him, why are you going to give up so much to go live in poverty and bring your, your children and your wife with you and, and you're leaving your family and friends and, and ministry in, in order to go minister to them? Why would you do that? And he said, a man is no fool to give up what he cannot keep in order to gain what he cannot lose. It's not foolish to sacrifice of earthly things knowing that it somehow, some way will translate itself into heavenly reward. And how many of you know the story of Jim Elliott and the ministry that he had? He was murdered down there by the very people he was ministering to. He gave of his life for the gospel of Jesus Christ. His wife, however, and the other women, there were more than just Jim Elliott died, but other men in his group died. But his wife and the other women went back to minister to those same Indians, bringing to them some medicine because they had become sick. And, and when the, the Aachen Indians saw the, the, the love that was there, they felt remorse, they felt guilt. We killed your husband, we're so sorry, but you still love us? Why would you love us? Tell us about this God. 
<laughs> revival broke forth. Due in part to Jim Elliott's sacrificing of himself, his stuff back in the States, and then his very life on the mission field. So Jesus said, If uh, no one who has left houses, brothers, sisters, father, mother, wife, or children, or lands for my sake in the Gospels, who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and lands, with persecutions. Don't leave that part out. I wish we could. Yeah, great. I'm going to get it all now, right? No, but there's also persecutions. And so not only blessed here and now, but also in the age to come, eternal life. Now, in this passage, I notice three things. Number one, we cannot outgive God. Whatever we give to the Lord, the Lord will more than compensate for. We read in Luke chapter 6, verse 38, Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be put in your bosom. For... Now, here's kind of a formula, and don't worry, I'm not going to get all religious television on you here. I'm not going to put the, the, the pressure on you to give. You give God a dollar, he owes you $100 sort of nonsense that we see on religious television. But, but that being said, notice what Jesus says here. For with the same measure that you use, the same measurement that you give to God, it will be measured back to you. And again, you cannot outgive God. Give to him and he promises you will be blessed. That's number one. Number two, I notice Jesus promises us persecutions. It's not usually one of those things you see in the precious promise books, you know, or the scriptures you put on your refrigerator. Yes, today God promises persecutions. Can't wait. Not one of those things we look for, but yet it's true. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, or chapter 3, verse 12, we read, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. In fact, it's almost as if you can gauge the level of persecution to the level of your Christian walk. If you're being persecuted for righteousness' sake, it shows that you're taking a stand and you're, you're out there preaching the gospel. But Jesus also said, Woe to those who are never persecuted, those who never have conflict for the gospel's sake. And so Jesus says, if you desire to live godly, you will suffer persecution. So again, number one, we cannot outgive God. Number two, Jesus has promises us persecutions. But then number three, the real payday is in heaven. It's important to remember. Because man, I'll tell you, sometimes in this life it gets frustrating, doesn't it? When's it going to pay off, God? Well, in heaven. But you, and God does bless us here and now, no question about it but nothing compared to the blessing that will be ours when we finally get to heaven. Now, I asked you to hold a place in Matthew chapter 6. Go ahead and turn there. Notice that Jesus uses heavenly reward as motivation for us to serve him. He uses heavenly reward as motivation for us to serve him. Look at verse 19. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. I, I've told this story probably way too many times, but I'll tell it again. When I was 18, I was on the game show The Wheel of Fortune. Anybody heard of The Wheel of Fortune? Yeah, a couple, few of you. Boy, look, I have a videotape, a VHS tape of it. It's scary to watch. Um, but uh, it used to be at the time where they didn't just give you money, but the big carousel in the center spun around, and you, if you won, you had to pick stuff off the carousel. Uh, for $5,000, I'll get this basket, you know, just overpriced stuff. And so you'd buy things with the money that you earned. And whatever was left over that wasn't enough to purchase something, you'd get a gift card. Well, eventually I got a gift card. By the way, I was the three-day champ on the Wheel of Fortune. And there's another, st I know, really, yeah. But a lady from Alabama who was a chicken farmer beat me off the third day, but that's neither here nor there. Yeah, yeah, you Alabama fans find that interesting. Well, one of the gift cards I got was from Giorgio of Beverly Hills on Rodeo Drive. You know the place where it takes 35 bucks to buy a pair of socks. And there was this 
sweater that was a hundred dollars and I had a hundred dollars. It was like, you know, a fourth off price. And so that's the only thing I could afford there. I got the, the sweater, brought it home, wore it, had the little Giorgio Beverly Hills emblem on it and thought I was all that in a bag of chips and whatever. Summertime rolls around, folded it up, put it in my closet. Wintertime came around. I opened it up. Guess what? Moth holes everywhere. Oh, whatever. So, uh, I read this, do do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. True, they do. They destroy stuff. And thieves break in and steal. I've had stuff stolen. Anybody else have things stolen from them? Yeah. Bummer, huh? Stinks. Lord Jesus, come quickly. You know? So don't do that. Don't have yourself all tied into your stuff. Because when, not if, when the stuff rots, is taken away, it's going to hurt if you're holding on to it tightly. Do your, do, try this with somebody stronger than you. Get a piece of rope. You hold on to it as tightly as you can. You tell the other stronger person, rip it out of my hands as much as you can. If you're holding on to it tightly, it's really going to hurt. Hold it loosely, won't hurt. Same is true with stuff. So don't have your heart tied into stuff. But, verse 20, lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Do you want to be heavenly hearted, heavenly minded? Lay up treasures in heaven. So the disciples, they had sacrificed to themselves greatly. In response, the Lord has rewarded them greatly. In fact, he promises the disciples that in the future he will yet reward them. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 28, Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, when Jesus returns to establish his kingdom, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Talk about future glory. And what did they do? James and John and Peter left a fishing business in order to follow Jesus. That's all they did. Uh, Matthew gave up his job with the Jewish IRS tax collector in order that he might follow Jesus. Jesus promises great blessing, great reward for sacrificing of yourself here in order to serve him and to serve others. Your reward in heaven will be great. So Jesus promised this to the disciples, but at this point, they were lacking eternal perspective because they wrongfully assumed that their day of reward was coming sooner than later. They were hoping that on this trip, Jesus would finally overthrow the Roman government and then would give important positions to those who were closest to him, which is why they argued amongst themselves as to who would be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus knew this. That's why back in Mark 10, verse 31, he said to them, but many who are first will be last, and the last first. If you put yourself first, the me first mentality, you're going to be last. The rich young ruler, a sad example of someone who put himself first, ended up last. I pray that God would protect us all from that me first mentality, which only leads to turmoil and strife. In fact, later on, we're going to see that James and John's me first mentality sparked strife within the disciples. And in verses 32 through 40, we read about an inappropriate request at an inopportune time. Inappropriate request at an inopportune time. Verse 32. Now, as they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was going before them, they were amazed. Something about Jesus at this point caused them to be amazed and fearful. Notice, and as they followed, they were afraid. His demeanor, his character, his his conviction, something. They were just really nervous, and they were afraid at this point. Then he took the twelve aside again. This isn't the first time. He had had said this to them before, and, and as in times past, it went over their heads. They didn't get it. 
So once again, he's trying to teach him the same lesson. He took the twelve aside again, began to tell them the things that would happen to him. And here's what he said. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man, which is a reference to himself. And by the way, if Jesus isn't fully man, then he is not able to be our substitute. But if he were only man, he wouldn't be able to be our substitute because he could only sacrifice of himself. But because he's fully God and fully man, the God-man, therefore he is able to take our place in judgment that we through him might be saved. And so he says, the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, to the religious rulers that were in power And they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. And they will mock him, scourge him, and spit on him, and kill him. And the third day he will rise again. The promise of the resurrection. So Jesus here spoke as plainly as anybody ever could. But the disciples had no idea what he was talking about. They did not understand what Jesus had been trying to teach them about self-sacrificial service. Again, it was all about them, that me-first mentality, which manifested itself in verse 35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, Teacher, now notice this request, by the way. Uh, Anybody else think that this is an odd request? Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Is that kind of odd? You know, they didn't say, will you please consider our request? No, they said, say yes before we even ask a question. Just say yes right now. You know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, some, some teenagers who have that give me what I want now attitude. You know, any of you ever have a teenager like that? You don't need, you know, okay. Well, let me ask you, how well did it go for them when they asked that question? Give me what I want now. How well does that go? So Jesus, in verse 36, the, okay, I'll play along. He says, what do you want me to do for you? I'm not going to say yes until you tell me what your request is. What would you like me to do for you? And they said to him, well, grant us that we may sit, one on your right hand and the other on your left, in your glory. So not much, just the two most prominent possessions in, or positions in heaven. Don't want much, just the two most important positions in heaven. Asking too much? Oh, yeah. Yes, it is. Now, Matthew's gospel gives us a little bit more detail about this event. And guess who it was that was encouraging the boys to do this, to ask this question? It was their mama. Their mama said, hey, go go to Jesus and, you know, tell him you want the most important positions in heaven. In fact, you know, I'll go with you, you know. He won't say no to me. After all, I'm a nice old lady and... You know, he likes me. Now, I I cannot blame a mama for wanting the best for her kids. However, this is a little much. And besides, this me-first mentality is exactly what Jesus had been teaching against. So they all come together, mama and the two boys. And again, these are grown men. And so they, what do you want me? Well, I want, you know, that you will grant my sons to sit one on your right hand, one on your left when you come into your glory. And he turned to them and said, you do not know what you ask. Do you have any clue what you're asking? Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with a baptism I am baptized with? And they said, oh, we are able. Just like that. No question about it. They, they had no idea what his cup was. They had no idea what his baptism was. But they, oh yeah, sure, we can do it. A week, less, less than a week later, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's praying about his cup. And he prays this, Abba, which is a Hebrew for daddy, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. You see, that cup, that cup was a cup of judgment. The cup of judgment against sin, against our sin, that Jesus had to drink down to the dregs in order for us to be forgiven. The cup of death, it's a cup of death, sacrifice. 
It is interesting that James, one of these boys asking this request, was the first disciple to be martyred, to drink a cup of man's judgment against himself for standing up for the gospel. Herod Agrippa, King Herod Agrippa, ordered John to be beheaded. Oh, James, I'm sorry. Thank you. So you knew what I meant. So, now, baptism. Jesus spoke of his baptism. We're told in Scripture how we can identify with that baptism in Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Baptism symbolizes a grave. A person comes to the waters of baptism as a dead sinner. In order to deal with a dead person, you've got to bury him. So they're buried with the Lord's death in baptism, but then they're raised a new creature in Jesus' resurrection to the newness of life. That's what baptism symbolizes. And so here we're, talking, or we're told about baptism, how it symbolizes the baptism, uh, the death of Jesus Christ. You know, John's attempted martyrdom had the very ironic resemblance of baptism. You know, John, there was, there was a, uh, uh, in fact, we read about it in Fox's Book of Martyrs. It's an old book. It chronicles the different Christian martyrs all the way through the uh, Middle Ages, the Dark Ages. And in Fox's Book of Martyrs, we're told this. John, the beloved disciple, was brother to James the Great. There were two Jameses that were disciples of Jesus. James, a brother, and John is called James the Greater because he's mentioned more often. And then there's also James the Less, who is mentioned less often. So anyway, John, the brother of James the Great, the churches of Smyrna, Pergamos, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, and Thyatira were founded by him. From Ephesus, he was ordered to be sent to Rome, where it was affirmed that he was cast into a cauldron of boiling oil. Boy, that's interesting baptism, isn't it? And uh, he escaped by miracle without injury. The emperor Domitian afterwards banished him to the islands of Patmos. And by the way, what did John do when he was on the island of Patmos? Wrote the book of Revelation. So when God's not done with you, you're bulletproof. Or you're boiling oil proof, apparently. He escaped, uh, banished him to the island of Patmos where he wrote the book of Revelation. Nerva, the successor of Domitian, recalled him. He was the only apostle who escaped a violent death. So James did drink the cup. John was indeed baptized with the baptism of Jesus. Notice in verse 39 how Jesus went on to say to them, You will indeed drink the cup that I drink. And with the baptism I am baptized with, you will be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give but it is for those for whom it is prepared. Could this mean that when Jesus returns with us, the church, and he establishes his kingdom, that there will be a very prominent person sitting on his right and another very prominent person sitting on his left? Very well could be. Don't know. Scripture is not clear, and so it's just a suggestion. However, when Jesus first opened the door to his kingdom... When he died on the cross, we do see that there was one on his right and one on his left. And by the way, of the few people that witnessed the crucifixion of Jesus, guess who one of the ladies was? The mother of James and John. I wonder if while Jesus was hanging on the cross, seeing one thief crucified on the right hand, another crucified on the left, if James... And John's mama thought, I am so glad Jesus didn't answer my request. I had no idea what I was asking for, to ask that when Jesus comes into his glory, my sons would be on either side of him. If he had granted that request, maybe James and John would have been hanging on that cross. You know, I love the prayer of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but as you will. 
always deferring to the will of God. Because do we know best? No. But God does. So, Lord, here's what I would like you to do. However, hey, your will be done. You have veto power, God. Go for it. Now, in verses 41 through 45, we're told, don't be like the world, but be like the Lord. Don't be like the world, but be like the Lord. So James and John, along with their mama, they asked this request, give us the most prominent positions in the kingdom. How well do you think that went with the other disciples? Verse 41, when the ten heard it, they began to be greatly displeased. Hey, it came close to fisticuffs. In the original Greek language in which to be greatly displeased means to be almost violently angry. You're just, help, you know. And why were they? Because they were offended at the pride of James and John? No, probably because they wished they had thought of going to Jesus first. They beat them to the punch. But you know, this event is another example of how that me-first mindset always stirs up conflict and strife. It always brings out the worst in others. Now, conversely from me first is the concept of joy. It's been said that joy, true joy, is an acronym standing for Jesus first, others second, and you last. So instead of strife, we can have joy when we put Jesus first, others second, and then ourselves last. And if we adopt that self-sacrificial heart of Jesus, then we will experience the fullness of joy that he promises us. But the me first mindset, my way sort of deal, I, I go first, no joy but strife. So Jesus called them to himself, verse 42, and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them. They just love to, to call the shots. They just love to, to uh, push people around and get their way. Their great ones exercise authority over them. I don't care what the people want. I'm just going to push my agenda. Yet it shall not be so among you. That might be fine for the world, but not for you. But whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, and I think we should all want to be. I think it's a desire that we should all, I want to be great in God's, I want to be the best pastor I can be. I want to be the best husband I can be. I want to be the best father I can be. And I want to be the best, when I play sports, I want to be the best that I can be out there. I want to be the best. I don't want to be the worst. That's dumb. You know, why would I want to be the worst? But there's a method of worldly greatness, how we achieve it, but then there's a method of achieving godly greatness, which is totally the opposite from worldly greatness. Godly greatness means self-sacrifice. Jesus first. Others second. You last. So if we want greatness in God's kingdom, we are not to be like the Gentiles. Whoever, verse 44, desires to be first shall become slave of all. Number one in God's kingdom, be a slave of all. True greatness in God's eyes is not in how much authority you have over others, but in how you are sacrificing yourself for the benefit of others. And then Jesus referred to himself as an example of this. Verse 45, even the Son of Man, speaking of himself, did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Didn't come to be served, but to serve. Didn't come to be waited upon, but came to wait upon others. Just like in Jared's message today of the communion, how Jesus washed the disciples' feet. Just a, a, beautiful, a beautiful example of Jesus serving us and to give his life a ransom for many. No greater example of greatness in God's eyes than Jesus Christ. Served us by sacrificing of himself on the cross, that we through faith in him might be saved. Now, at this point, the disciples didn't get it. They're still clueless. But after Jesus rose from the dead, and after the disciples were baptized with the Holy Spirit, then they finally realized what Jesus was trying to get across. They went on to live 
self-sacrificially. They serve the body of Christ in many awesome, miraculous ways. And we will read about those ways when we come to the book of Acts in the months or years to come, should the Lord tarry. But at this point again in Mark's gospel, Jesus and his disciples are making their way toward Jerusalem. Now, before they got to Jerusalem, they had to go first through the city of Jericho, where they met a man who was blind, and his name was Bartimaeus. We will get to that next week, Lord willing. To sum up, and beware of when a pastor says, in conclusion, or to sum up, but I, you know, usually I don't say to sum up, I just end it, catch you all by surprise, but here's my ending, here we go. It'll take all of a minute. Spiritual success, greatness in God's eyes, is all about sacrificing of oneself for the benefit of others. That point we all understand, right? I beat that horse to death, didn't I? Jesus is truly the greatest example of all. Again, in verse 45, I don't think we can read it enough. Let's look at it again. In fact, let's all read it out loud together. Ready? One, two, three. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. I pray that the Lord delivers us all from that me-first mindset that only leads to emptiness and strife. And instead, may we adopt the self-sacrificial servant heart of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that we might experience true joy, fullness of joy. And also by so doing, we'll find out by and by that our sacrifice here translates itself in future glory there. Now I'm done. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time in your word. Lord, for these words that you spoke to your disciples that are so true for us today. Lord, uh, I pray you'd forgive us for any me-first mindset of having our own agenda and, and manipulating and trying to get our wills done. Lord, that's not what it's about. It's about serving you, serving others, becoming a slave to all. And Lord, as you showed when you washed the disciples' feet, and especially as you showed when you died on the cross, Lord, help us to be willing to sacrifice of ourselves. Lord, for your glory, for your namesake, knowing that we can never, ever outgive you. You will more than compensate both here and especially in eternity. Lord, we love you. We trust you. And we pray, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Shall we stand for closing?